Tokegeko morphs. While a lot argue that the normal wild type morph Tokegekos are the most beautiful and just should be left alone, I have found such a fascination with genetics of Tokes and really how the morphs work with each other and really what you can create from this, you know, just powder blue with orange or red spots to just this crazy thing. Even the variations that we have to this day, you know, changing the color of spots, reducing the amount of red spots or the barring, uh, almost to the point where we can simplify it or even make it even more complex, it just transformed the animal to look like something completely different. I just find it fascinating, just incredible, you know, what you can do with these morphs. So today I thought I'd make a video all about the different Tokei Gecko morphs. We'll be going over to some of the uh, the more common ones, like the reduced patterns and pattern lists, things like that, over to the more rare, complex things. So sit back, relax, and let's dive into Tokei Gecko genetics. this video out talking about the more uh, easier to come by the more common morphs and any with the more rare stuff and what better way to start this video than talking about the first toke morph that I actually purchased which is of course that reduced pattern now the reduced pattern does pretty much exactly what the name suggests. It reduces the pattern. So while you have the normal wild caught morph being a powdered blue with those red or orange spots, what this genetic is going to do is going to create a gecko with a more reduced pattern. So you're going to have uh, pretty much little to no orange dots. You're still going to have the white barring on the uh, down the torso, but there are going to be a lot less orange dots than you would typically see in a wild morph. Now, the amount of orange that stays in a gecko seems to vary on gecko to gecko. Uh, for instance, my male seems to have just a couple spots here and there, whereas the babies so far have virtually zero dots. That's not to say they're never going to have those orange dots. Of course, they are still very young, only varying from a couple weeks to a month or two old. So maybe towards the uh, end of the line, when they fall into a full adult, they might become a little more orange dots, or they might not have any. Well, I just have to find out. Now going into a little bit about the genetics of the reduced pattern, as we know the genetic is an incomplete dominant which then results into a 50-50 match if either you're going to get normal babies or the uh, visual morph of the reduced pattern. Let me prove in as well my last clutch. Uh, I actually ended up hatching out four reduced patterns and two normal babies with that. Now with this reduced pattern and it being a complete dominant morph, you will not be getting any of those, you know, like a uh, het for reduced pattern. It's either going to show the visual of the morph <laughs> or it's not. What are you doing? What are you doing over there? Hey, hey, you done? You done being a goof? One thing to note before we do move on to the next morph is I find it really interesting watching the babies grow up. Going from this adult that has just this olive body and this bluish head down to these babies that start out just completely dark blue and then as you can see uh, resulting to a couple months later start transitioning into that more of that greenish olivey color. It's just it's a really cool thing to watch these tokes grow up. Moving on let's talk about what seems to be the most asked about morph in the hobby right now and that of course is the patternless. As far as the patternless gene goes, there seems to be a little bit of a variation between, of course, the most sought after right now is the powdered blues, but there also are uh, more variations such as the olive patternless. And like most of the token names, this is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, what the patternless gene does is just completely take away from that pattern. So instead of having, again, the wild top with those orange spots and the powdered blue, you pretty much just have a blue gecko. <laughs> have any personal experience with breeding patternless geckos. I'm still waiting for my pair to grow up. Hopefully in 2021, I'll be getting some awesome eggs from those guys. However, from my understanding, it is a recessive gene, which in state that means basically um, that the gene, you will need two copies of that. So for instance, pairing a uh, patternless gecko with a normal wild caught morph, you are gonna get a an offspring that is heterozygous for that morph, not showing a visual display, in which case you will need to li either line breed that baby back to its parent to get visual patternless or, the, or, or uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 or that ammo with another gecko that has a copy of that gene. Didn't think you'd be getting a genetics lesson from Dakota now, did ya? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Now, an interesting thing I see with recessive traits for toke geckos is the fact that even if they are heterozygous or het for that gene, you can still see a visual difference. Since baby toke geckos that are het for that patternless genes show a little bit less of those red spots than you would see out of a normal wild type. As I mentioned, bringing that to another gecko with the heterozygous gene will then result in those geckos that have a little bit of dots down to geckos that show no spots at all. And then moving on, we'll be talking about the next morph, which is going to be the green galaxy. 
Now, the Green Galaxy is a project done by Morgan from Homegrown Scales. Uh, obviously, you know, I've mentioned her a bit on this channel. Of course, I've bought multiple geckos for her, and she was on my podcast recently. And Morgan really produces just some amazing patternless base geckos. And with these Green Galaxies, it definitely makes a twist with it. Pretty much, the Green Galaxy is almost the opposite of a reduced pattern. So you're getting these geckos that instead of taking away of the orange spots and keeping that white barring, you're getting a patternless base geckos with the orange spots. It's not going to be like that normal wild top morph where there's these blotches of these orange and red spots everywhere. No, these are almost like sprinkled on. It definitely does make like, it almost looks like a galaxy when you're looking at it. When this gecko is fired down, you can definitely see a lot more of these orange spots and just this speckling that just looks incredible. And then when they fire up, it's almost like this marbled white. I mean, these guys are incredible. Honest, I don't know much about the Green Galaxy genetics and really what goes into making them. All I do know is they are amazing and I really cannot wait in 2021 to see what this male is going to produce because that is just, I'm very excited. Right, guys, before we wrap this up, I wanna talk about one more genetic morph toke that I have that really is kind of a mystery. Come on, sweetie. Calm down. I know, I know. Oh, so fresh. Fresh toque. Oh. <laughs> Easy, girl. I gotta get your picture. This is Oddball. Now, Oddball seems to be more of a genetic anomaly? 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 You know what I'm saying. <laughs> as far as I can tell, and I've definitely reached out to quite a few people, no one really knows what Oddball is. She is this strange toke gecko. I got her as a, an adult import who got her as second hand from Nerd. Um, so as far as I can tell, I just don't know what she is. Now Oddball has been in my care for quite a few months now. I'll post a little Instagram picture right there of when I first got her. Uh, she was not in very good condition. She was definitely a standard import, you know, very skinny, dehydrated. Uh, but through this time, I've definitely raised her up to where she is a nice breeding weight at this point and is perfectly fine for breeding. Uh, however, after pairing her with her first male, it's been about, I wanna say, around two months now and they just have not gotten the deed done. So I'm actually in the process of now removing the male, having the, them cool down, make sure the scent of the male's uh, no longer in the enclosure. So I'll take about, you know, anywhere from three to four weeks and then trying to pair her with Big Red, my big normal male, and see, you know, if he can get the job that that reduced pattern just wasn't able to do. <laughs> Well, it's a project that I'm most excited about. I mean, this gecko is just incredible. It's She's almost like, I don't want to say melanistic, but very dark base while still holding those white bands, but really little to no orange spots. She has some in the face, but really it's only the face. I mean, this thing's just incredible. And I'm really excited to see, you know, what these genetics could involve down the line. Could this be a new genetic morph by Dakota? Probably not. Uh, most likely this is just a morph that's just hard to tell. She may be just a weak result of one morph or the other, or maybe it's just something that we haven't seen in a while. Uh, it, not sure, but the fact that I might have my own morph, I mean, it, it's, it's not very likely. <laughs> We're not giving up hope though. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna call them DB's geckos. That's what they're gonna be called. <laughs> and that's really the thing when it comes to Toke geckos. While there are some morphs that we do know about, there are a lot that we don't. And really the only way to find out what to do with these guys is really line breed them. So this girl will be pairing in with a normal male. And in fact, I'll take those babies, raise them up, and then line breed them back to the female to see if we can uh, produce any of these visual traits that the female has. Or maybe it's just this weird anomaly, you know, just a paradox. It's a one-off thing, or it's just something that I can't really see. But I don't know, just even with that small percentage that this might be a new crazy morph, you know, that no one else is working with, that definitely, you know, gets me pretty excited and wants me to push and making sure that this girl is the healthiest she is, you know, thriving and make sure that she produces some nice eggs. All right, are you ready to, are you ready to go back in? I think you are. This is the first time she's actually been out. I've actually just left her alone for months, making sure she's gained weight, but I want to take her after this video. Uh, she was not happy being out of the enclosure. You can already see. She is like, Dad, what are you doing? You have never done this before. See, that really just goes to show you, you know, these guys really aren't that bad with handling. It's just the initial getting them to calm down, and then once they are, they just kind of lay still like this, and you know, just chill out on you, ready for something to come to your finger and attack. <laughs> Oh no, I mean, this is an imported toke that has little to virtually zero handling, and it probably took me two minutes to grab her out from the cork, uh, the little cork flat, and then get her on, fit me a few times, and then settle down like this, where I feel comfortable just holding her with my bare hand. So, I mean, yeah, really, it just goes to show, you know, handling tokes, it's not as difficult as one would think. Be prepared to take a few bites, but, um, that's where I wear the wimp glove.
<laughs> all right, sweetie. All right, we'll put you, we're gonna put you back in your cage. You know, I know you don't like being out here. It's gonna wrap it up for today. We saw some cool tokes, talked a little bit about genetics and how they work, and you know, took oddball out. You know, I don't take oddball out, and you don't really show her that often, so it's pretty cool, you know, seeing her firsthand definitely on the channel. If you guys are interested in checking out some more toke Mars, I will have a video idea coming out next week where I'm collabing with um, some of my fellow toke breeders. They're gonna be sending me some clips for their tokes, and we'll be talking about more of the rare, uh, you know, harder to come by and more uncommon morphs. That should be coming out, you know, sometime next week. I gotta put it all together, make sure I get all the pieces, and you know, do the video justice because yeah, I got a lot of people contributing and I really want to make it a really nice video so don't forget to uh, you know subscribe all that stuff I guess <laughs> I don't know why I'm a youtuber man I, I suck at talking I really do <laughs> you don't want to miss out on your chance to check out the video so make sure to subscribe you know check out the, the like button if you do as well because you know it helps out the channel it helps me out you know man, it's one click man you can do it come on <laughs> other than that if you want to see some more of my animals my breeding products you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at DBCB Exotic, and of course we also have the Herp Hour. The Herp Hour is a podcast that I do with myself and Professor Herp off on Twitch. Uh, we just did one with Scales 13. It went pretty good. Uh, we talked about uh, some of the Dave Coffin footage, a little bit about the Aki monitors, and we talked about monitor care in general, and really what we think about that. We dived into a little bit more of like UVB, which I really didn't expect it. It was an interesting conversation. I definitely recommend checking that out. You can find it on Twitch. I will leave the link in the bio. And other than that, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day.